Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I have a guest from Australia today. I'm really excited to have Jeff Houston, someone whose blog entries, research, presentations that I'm very big fan of reading. But before we start, I would like to do our normal video and then we will be right with you together with Jeff Houston. <laughs> Hi Jeff, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing how I'm doing really good. How about yourself? Well, you know, early morning, midwinter, but I'm awake, I'm there, I'm here. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate you being available really early this hour and you know accommodating our request. I know it's it's kind of tough. So I want to get right in. Uh, we have a lot of people that will be joining us. I, I'm pretty confident that we're gonna receive a lot of questions. So I want to give as much as time possible to our listeners. But I want to start with first, how are you doing with this pandemic, with this, what's going on? And you're one of the most experienced, most traveling scientists in the whole world uh, when it comes to internet infrastructure. Uh, tell us a little bit how this is impacting you. Wow. Um, I think I calculated last year in 2019, I'd spend a total of around eight months <laughs> not being where I am. And, and, and I enjoy NOG meetings. I enjoy a lot of these kind of technical meetings. I enjoy IETFs. The interplay of ideas and people is just fascinating. And I think you've got to remember out of all of this that a lot of technology is a conversation. Absolutely. It doesn't exist outside of people. And being in touch with people, talking about the technology is, is kind of what makes it work for me. And so all of a sudden being grounded the way we have, certainly in Australia, uh, is a dramatic change. And I've, I've taken to the keyboard. Um, <laughs> I've written way more than I probably should have and done a whole bunch more of, of research that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise, which is, you know, the best way I can do to get by. But, you know, I miss it. I miss it, as I said, because I think the interplay of, of what people and, and their perspectives on technology and, and what we do together is actually really the thing that drives me. So, you know, I'm waiting for the planes to start flying again. I'm waiting for all this lockdown to kind of come back and, you know, go away and resume life. But it may be some time yet. Absolutely. And how are things in general in Australia uh, comparing to the rest of the world? Can you share some of your thoughts about how Australia is dealing with the pandemic from your point of view? Um, well, it's certainly been a bit of a wake-up call in many ways. And like, like many Western societies, uh, there's a lot of commute culture. There was a huge amount, and in certainly the larger cities, of stress on the transportation systems of getting all these worker bees from where they sleep to where they work and getting them home again. And, of course, lockdown, which we experienced in Australia for about four, four to six weeks in intense levels, it kind of opened up some eyes about why do I do this every day? And the current conversation in the country is, well, two days a week, three days a week, I'll do the rest from home. And, you know, I think that's a good thing. That's certainly why we built these networks to actually enable enough bandwidth, enough facilities, enough resources that my space where I work, my space where I interact, and the level of bandwidth to see people so that after about five minutes, it's not a network anymore. You're beside me. You're just behind my screen. It's you. And, and I think once you get to that point, it's as natural as being there. And, you know, this is what we intended to build. And it's fascinating that in my lifetime, you know, about 30 yeah. years later, coming from scratchy little pixelated heads and crap audio, we're now at a point where the experience is close to immersive. And like I said, after a while in these kinds of conversations, you're right opposite me. We're together. And that's great. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff, uh, you are also, you know, when you travel, not 
only you give great presentations about your research, but you also heavily participate, you know, development of the you know, DNS protocols, DNS operations meeting, IETF. Do you believe this lack of travel or, uh, you know, just but we don't know how long it may continue. Uh, let's just assume another, you know, six more months. Let's say this year, no travel. How do you think this may, if at all, would impact uh, IETF, DNSOR, you know, DNS development? Uh, what are some of your thoughts about this? You know, I learned C, God, 1980, 81. And at the time, it was Brian Kernigan and Ken Ritchie, and it was their thought. If you look at V4, Bob Kahn and Vince Orff surf, and it was their thought. It was sort of a single idea from one or two people with consistency and coherence that was awesome, breathtaking. I look at committee design protocols and I start with PL1. Remember PL1? Yeah. You shouldn't. It was horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> whenever we get together in a committee, and V6 is a classic example, everyone needs to add their own nut, their own bolt. And the result is a mess. It is inconsistent. It's fuzzy. It's difficult to comprehend because there's no theme behind it. And personally, technology by committee is death. And so I'm actually really optimistic about this period that I hope that a few bright folk are actually working on their own This is a and having single strong. ideas and single concepts because the stuff that really works brilliantly is actually only in the brain of one or two people. And that's how you get to comprehend it because to understand that technology, I don't need to understand what the committee was thinking. I just need to understand that person's thought. Now, it may not be everything, but that's the beauty of this. It does, you know, a few things consistently and better. So I'm really optimistic about this, that we'll actually get less committee work and, and more inspired genius. Might be bad ideas too, but that's just the way it works. But I think this might actually give us a rethink on how we really should develop technology. Because, like I said, I think the committee work fails us most of the time. Oh, this is a very strong statement. You know, uh, a lot of people spend uh, hours, days, weeks, months on the road trying to, you know, help uh, bring thing, make things better. But, you know, uh, I hear from you. Please let me know if I misunderstood. But you're basically saying things might be even better right now with lack of travel and more focus and things might be developed even further, easier. I just want to remind our viewers uh, that they can go ahead and ask questions in the comment section in YouTube and any other platform that they're watching us, Twitch, Facebook, they can comment and the questions come to us and I would like to give you guys an opportunity to, to ask questions to Jeff. Jeff, I want to dive right in the, the other questions. So lockdown started, internet utilization just spiked because everybody's at home. What else they can do <laughs> to instead of just using internet? I mean, kids are home. It's a global uh, pandemic so the impact was global even though shutdowns kind of happen in uh, you know different times periods what are some of your observations from the internet utilization i know that you have done a great research with my good friend joao um, and the a dns view of lockdown which our viewers can visit in your blog and read more but can you please tell us about General observation, I don't want you to just focus on the DNS portion of it, but as much as other information you can share with us that you're aware. Well, it's probably true to say that there are two internets because when we used to go to work and, and you know, drive to the office and, and go in and sit down at the machine in the office, we were in an enterprise environment. Now, enterprise environments are different from home environments. Home environments generally a plug and play. My ISP and the boxes that I buy define my environment. And, and so in some ways, it's an externally created environment. And as a home consumer, you know, I'm there for the ride. But in the enterprise world, there's a lot less of that laissez-faire attitude because they have a network manager, a security manager, or this manager, or that manager. Yes. And, and most of these environments are heavily tailored and crafted. Now, we can see this in a number of ways. 
Uh, and two of the classics is actually IPv6 and, and DNS. So let's talk a little bit about IPv6. Because when you look hard, when you actually do massive measurements every hour of the day across all of the internet, you actually see there's more IPv6 on the weekends than there is in weekdays. And if you actually split the day apart, you'll actually find there's more IPv6 in the evening than in the day when you look at a particular locale. Why is that? Because enterprises don't do V6. For whatever reason, and it's not really, if you will, pejorative in saying this, but they don't trust it, so they don't deploy it. Now, we see the same, oddly enough, with the DNS, because in the work environment, they don't use the pre-canned provider-supplied DNS infrastructure. They either don't trust it, they don't want to use it, it's, you know, whatever reason, they tend to use other services. Fascinatingly, Google's public DNS, 8888, is actually more common in enterprise than it is from home networks. The reason, again, enterprises are quite willing to tinker, but home users aren't. The tinker switch is hardly ever used. And so what you see when people go home to work is fascinating. Now, I thought naively, well, they'll take their VPNs with them. They will teleport their computer back into the work environment and we won't see a single change. VPNs aren't that common. And that's, again, bizarre to me. But the work environment is different from the working from home environment. And the working from home environment looks like home. They use the DNS resolvers from home. They actually use V6 like they're at home because they are at home. They don't bring the work environment to home. They just use what's around. And, and so you, you're kind of left asking the question, was all that time and money we spent building this customized work environment worth it? Why didn't we just fire all those people and use what comes out, out, of, out of the box from the ISP? Because that's what we've been doing for the last four months. And the signatures of use are different. But the issue is, I'm actually sure that the same amount of work gets done probably as effectively. This kind of leads to a whole new box of issues, which are extraordinary. We went from mainframes to laptops to pocket things, but this new cloud business is transformational in so many ways. You know, people who run computers in the basement at work are worse than reptiles. They really are the dinosaurs of our, our world. You know, if you really want to do things efficiently and effectively, go hire the service that those computers create. There's no point having that hardware locked away. There's no point running your own technology anymore. Put it on the cloud and get on with your life. And, and that's happened over the last five years and it's changed the internet and it's changed you and I because we don't need these customized environments. Yeah. Everything is app centric now, and it's the application that's important. The underlying platforms, yeah, just a bit of silicon, just some software, and and this application transformation of the internet affects so many things. The IETF was busy getting, well, I'd call it non-linear. They got very very excited over DNS over HTTPS. It seemed like some fundamental law of networking had been broken. How dare an infrastructure have the audacity to appear as an application level subroutine call? How dare you lift infrastructure and pop it, in, pop it into the application? It's the same as what Google did with Quick. How could you take TCP and make it an application subroutine? And the answer is the application now rules. The application is everything. And the application is squeezing all the other factors for its survival into itself and creating its own external environment. It runs its own DNS. It runs its own transport. And that transformation over the last couple of years is, I think, fundamental in terms of change in the way we view networks, in the way we view services, and actually in the way we view clouds. Because clouds rule right now. This is where we are. Okay. We can explore the implications of that if you want, but you know, getting your head around that is a long way to understanding today's networking. 
it is very not surprising, I must say, as a person who is implementing uh, DNSSEC and who has implemented IPv6 to see the IPv6 utilization being higher during the peak hours of home usage. I mean, enterprises are in most of the cases are so behind. It is unbelievable. By the way, my dear, my friends, my lovely friends, stop texting me your questions. <laughs> <laughs> some of my friends are actually texting questions. We have some really good questions. I would like to just pass those on to you, Jeff, if, if that's okay. Uh, the first sure. question is coming from Kevin. Kevin is asking, you were at the beginning when the rules were created. Uh, if you could go back and which which rules would you change? And I don't exactly mean what is, what I'm assuming this is like protocols uh, related a question. What would you do it differently with protocols? I went to some of the early ITFs. I remember going to one in 1989, which, you know, came after a period of time where the work was very US centric and funded predominantly through US research infrastructure funding in various ways. And I was struck by the fact that I wasn't an American. I wasn't part of the group that started it, but I was welcome. I was welcomed as a peer and it struck me as amazing because the telephone companies were highly secretive. They weren't open. They didn't admit newcomers as individuals and value their participation. But here was this group. They were meeting four times a year, which at the time was pretty intense. But they welcomed people. They welcomed folk with an interest. So if you go back and go, wow, would I have changed anything? The answer is no. I, I would have changed nothing about what we did and why we did it. That spirit of welcoming participation rather than saying, well, you're not from X, would the representative from Digital please stand up and say something and we'll all listen? None of that. It didn't matter who employed you. It was whether your idea had merit. Um, that was what we were trying to change from where we were and trying to get rid of this structural ossification of the telephone industry. The fact that some gnomes in Switzerland had blessed this august committee, so everything it said was right, was everything that was bad about the, you know, was bad about you know, what we had. I mean, everything we wanted the IETF to change. That we saw ourselves basically as technology first and everything else second. Would I have changed that? No way. Yep. Yep. I mean, that was a little rock towards ITU, but you know, we will not <laughs> go too much into <laughs> Details into that one. Uh, we have Chris, good friend of mine. Hi, Chris. Thanks for watching. Chris is a is a great engineer. Uh, he's asking, care to comment on commercial reasons rather than technical for DNS control? This has been what I heard for driving factories factors. Sorry, for DNS control. Um, there are only two protocols that go everywhere these days, and it's not IP, as we well know, and it's not IPv6, as we well know. There's only two protocols that kind of force stuff through. One is the DNS. And it's actually UDP port 53 goes, goes everywhere if you force it hard enough, and HTTPS. So whether I'm designing goodware or malware, no matter what I'm trying to do, if I want to get packets through, I've really got a limited palette to work with. I've either got the DNS or I've got HTTPS. Now, the DNS is kind of brilliant for a whole bunch of reasons about it's extremely lightweight. You can use it for more things than just resolving names. You can move data around. You can do all kinds of wonderful things, and folk exploit that. Now, nothing wrong with that. Protocols are there to be used in any way you want. And, and so, you know, folk reach for the toolkit. Up comes the DNS. Let's just use it. Is that bad? Well, I don't know. It's not really a good or bad decision. The driving factors here are utility, ease of use, and connectivity. And the DNS is brilliant for that. So, you know, little wonder that if you want massive command and control systems for good or bad, the DNS is a phenomenally agile candidate. You know, it just works so well and it's everywhere. Why wouldn't you use it? Um, the only thing that I find surprising about the DNS is, is the point that its levels of absorption of abuse are fantastic. 
We care a lot about the root service of the DNS, and, and maybe so we should. In theory, every discovery starts with a query to the root. So these root servers are special. Yes? Well, maybe. If anyone runs Chrome, the first thing it does when it's sort of looking around itself going, I'm an app, where am I? Is it sends three queries of between seven and 15 characters, single label, outwards. Now, there's no such name in the DNS. So these queries go to the root servers and the answer comes back, no name. How much Chrome is there? Well, we're told about 80% of users use Chrome. A lot of Chrome, yep. A lot of Chrome. And each of those instances of Chrome, every time they boot up and every once in a while when it's just bored and going, oh, well, let's have a look again, sends three queries to the root. Of all the queries at the root, how many is Chrome responsible for? Jeez. About 80%. 50, 50, 55% or okay. more. So why do we build this massive root server infrastructure? To answer Chrome queries with no. So this entire root service infrastructure is sitting there answering no. And we spend an awful lot of money to say no very quickly, very efficiently. But the answer is still no. Some <laughs> of these things are kind of bizarre. Why did Chrome do it? Why did Chrome abuse the DNS in such a phenomenal way? It was cheap. It was free. It's fast. Everything the DNS was meant to be. And so in some ways, Chrome had no option but to go down the cheap, fast path. And so you know, I don't blame Chrome for doing this, but I think the outcomes are kind of weird. And if the root servers are busy complaining they've got to buy a new system every week or something, they should send the bill to Chrome. <laughs> All right, that was a that was a very good one. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, as a former uh, root operator myself, uh, during my ICANN times, uh, I don't think this was a big deal. But it's been a long time since uh, you know I left ICANN and Google Chrome just took over the world. the The only thing I can comment in general is uh, obviously a lot of people are relying in so many different things. Uh, now I remember, you know, there were some some software that I came across with where it's in during its boot sequence, it had to send a query. And I remember uh, looking at the source code saying a root server, they must always work. <laughs> <laughs> like people were people were so certain to boot their own system to send a query. Well, <laughs> nothing yeah. wrong with that because the root server system had so much investment of time and energy that, to be perfectly frank, it is always there. It does always work. So why not use it? You know, if I build a road past your house, use it. Absolutely. Otherwise, why did I bother? Absolutely. I have a, a question from Joe. Um, this is about voting. I don't know if, if you want to answer this, uh, but how have you put much thought on into online election voting? Do you think it could be done securely? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> shut up. You know, I, 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 I'll take this in a more generic sense about security and encryption and the sort of the fundamental trust we put into the internet. That's my bank, isn't it? So I log into my bank. And my bank in particular, um, I suppose it's a standard commercial bank. Who is it? Well, it's the Bank of Akamai. And now, hang on a second. <laughs> I'm not a customer of the Bank of Akamai. Why am I logging into Akamai for my bank? How do I know it's my bank? And how does Akamai know that I'm a customer of some third party bank. And, and the answer, of course, is in this wonderful mess of internet infrastructure security. And so much of what we do is propped up by what we call the public key infrastructure. And so inside the public key infrastructure are around oh, about 150 entities that issue certificates for public private key pairs. They issue the public key part. And, and the, the social contract with the rest of the internet is they never, ever lie, ever. Because otherwise, how do you know which key is fake? How do you know if I'm really Jeff? Because you trust those folk to never lie. So when Symantec issue a certificate, for example, .com, as they did before they died, I'm like, oh, they say, oops, never again. But how many other certificates were like that? When CNNIC issue a certificate for the Egyptian Telecommunications Agency, who happened to 
effectively certify that this Egyptian telecommunications agency is really Google in disguise so they can spy on their citizens. How long did it take us to, to detect this? Well, it took a little while. Could you happen again? Well, of course it could. Our trust systems on the internet, and particularly this whole PKI infrastructure, is the rancid sewerage at the bottom of the pond. It is an incredible mess. And every single attempt to try and clean this up, we actually get the incumbents, who make a lot of money out of certificates, say, oh, no, no, no. It'll disturb our business model. So things like Dane trying to put secure systems back in the DNS, which gave us a lot more control and made DNSSEC worthwhile. It was the only use for it. Who resisted it? Well, the browser folk and the certificate issuers. And, and their answer wasn't, well, our system's better, because it isn't. The answer was, well, it takes too long and we're not going to let you fix it. Absolutely. So... You know, are you going to put your trust in, in secure systems on the internet? Um, I, I find it sort of silly to actually think that it's always going to be your bank. And the only reason that it is, is random chance, and it's unlikely you're going to be a victim. But it's so easy to make you a victim in this system because the instruments of security are just a complete mess. Oh, by the way, it's okay. We have certificate transparency. Every issued certificate has to be logged publicly and you can see issued certificates. Wonderful. Same weak service in a nanosecond world. So they will tell you definitively that you were a victim a week ago. You're still a victim. You've still been done. But now we know. This is ridiculous. Certificate transparency was never an answer for this kind of problem. Oh, we can revoke certificates. You can't. No one checks for revocation takes too long. So the entire system creaks and groans. It's worse than terrible. Uh, you know, words fail me as to how bad this rancid mess really is. But somehow we seem incapable of actually working together to fix it. And so when you say, should we use this wonderfully secure system for voting? Um, I guess so. But I'm not too sure. I, frankly, if it was my country and my national security system and the ease with which the secure infrastructure can be completely nobbled, would say, I think you're a bit optimistic. Thank you, Jeff. And Joe also is thanking you for the great answer. We have another question. Uh, all right. So NetFlow sampling, uh, do you... Do you use a lot of NetFlow in your research or do you use usually like a DNS flow specifically on NetFlow, but focus more on DNS? Uh, this is a, a generic question if you want. Right. To. And let me, I suppose, firstly answer, I don't use NetFlow. I okay. used to in a different life. And I actually don't use passive sampling. I used to in a different life. Mm -hmm. um, how accurate is NetFlow? Um, at the time I was using it, we were doing one in 100, but we were also doing every packet. And we were comparing, is this really one in 100? Every and, the answer was, and the answer was, well, every packet said, nah. How accurate <laughs> was it? Well, nah. should we make a billing system based on NetFlow was the real question the product managers were asking me. And the answer was, well, you can. You just can't stand by the answer, but you can. So how accurate is it? Well, it depends. Um, how can you calculate the real value? Well, capture every packet. But why don't I use it anymore? Because in some ways, looking at the traffic, trying to divine why, is a hopeless task. All this deep packet inspection is busy being counted by all this encryption. If you look at a current Chrome browser running quick, what do you know? Nothing. Is it doing DNS? I don't know. Is it doing streaming? Well, there are a lot of packets. Maybe it is. <laughs> so I actually find measurement these days, and I do a lot of measurement. I run, I think, perhaps the world's largest measurement system by seeding the packets into the network and watching them come back. So if you think about it, a DNS label is actually microcode. I can put all kinds of information into a label. I send it to you, and you ask it to me. I know it's you because I put you in the label. I know when you asked it, I put the time in the label. 
that's okay. You asked me a question. What if that same question comes in from Germany two hours later? You're not in Germany. The packets between me and you never went through Germany. How is a server in Germany finding out a one-off question that you asked and playing it back to me? And this kind of stuff I find fascinating, that realistically, when you do active measurement and you probe the network to respond, not only is it interesting to see the way the network has responded at the time, but what's equally fascinating is to see the echoes of that transaction again and again and again. So the DNS is not what you think it is. The DNS is a vast storage system and you can treat it as a massive disk. Encode your data as a question and ask anyone. And then when you listen, you know, you'll find that question back again months later. So if you're patient, the system will return your data to you. And, and because the DNS never forgets. And, and it seems that around half the queries in the DNS, or maybe more, aren't real. It's almost like we've done this artificial intelligent life that the DNS now captures queries and just endlessly recirculates it. But perhaps more worrisome is the fact that the reason why this is happening is surveillance. The reason why this is happening is there are an awful lot of folk who actively listen, like NetFlow, to the network. And when they pick up a DNS query, they can't resist the temptation to ask again. <laughs> when they pick up a URL, they ask again. And so there's this huge overload of various forms of surveillance happening by all kinds of people. And it's about half the traffic of the internet, bizarrely. Fantastic. Jeff, uh, let's, you are one of the you know, well-known global experts of DNS. And you know, DNSSEC is one of the areas you also speak about, do research about. I want to ask a question, you know, as a person who was heavily involved uh, with the root DNSSEC signing 10 years ago, I'm, I'm very proud to see DNSSEC, you know, is, is continuing to get adopted. But also I'm a little bit sad to see that it's not getting adopted as much as it, it should have been. It should be just like by default enabled everywhere and there's just working seamlessly, right? How do you feel about the NSSEC adoption? Uh, is it, if you were to compare with IPv6 or the percentage wise, of course, it's, it's, it's higher percentage. Uh, IPv6 is higher percentage than the NSSEC, but what are some of your comments and what are some of the things that are, you think is stopping this? So a bit like IPv6, DNSSEC was only half built. Um, and it was kind of the easy half, not the hard half. And we actually do not know if we can support everybody doing DNSSEC. Mm -hmm. um, I tried it for a while and, and I thought it was just too masochistic in the end. <laughs> I ran the validator on my own you know, device, on my, on my mobile, on my laptop. So whenever my system asked a DNS query and got back an answer, it validated for itself. It validated on my machine. And all of a sudden, this fast internet turned into an exercise in, my God, I was back in modems again. It was <laughs> glacial. And, and part of the reason why is that the technology used to validate DNSSEC answers is incredibly slow because you have to query and query and query and query. And for some reason, don't know why, the implementers decided that they wouldn't query in a storm because that would melt the DNS, wouldn't it? They query serially. Ask A, get answer A. Ask B, get answer B. Ask, And it's kind of, none of us live this long. And so the current version of DNSSEC that's implemented is odd. My recursive resolver, be it Cloudflare, DNS, or even my ISP, if it did validation, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> does the validation task inside its own caching systems. You know, and it slaves away and does that. And what it does over an unprotected open channel is to set one bit to say, I've validated and it's all good. And it's kind of, but how do I trust that bit? I'm like, anyone can add that bit. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And so if you think DNSSEC is having the recursive resolver send a magic bit to me to say it's all good, I think you're mistaken. 
because if this is my bank, if this is my election voting system, if this is something I need to trust, then I need to do it myself. But the problem with DNSSEC is we had one idea and then decided we'd implement. And the problem was that was half the idea. And so when folk come along afterwards and go, you're missing the other half, the answer is no, we're too busy implementing. We're too busy deploying. We're too busy doing all this stuff. We won't make it better. Ask me about RPKI and we'll play the same ghastly tape again that we got so hung up on the first, I don't know, 50%, that the other bit to actually make it useful, effective, fast, cheap, practical, never got built. And DNSSEC, if you run it at the end, if you run it as a user, you'll hate your life. You just, there's no other way to describe it. We have not made it useful. And so why would you build it? Why would you deploy it right now? Apart from the mass hysteria over counting the number of people who are doing it, What's it good for? Now, it becomes mad and bizarre when you realize that most countries do structural name filtering. It's part of the framework in almost every country around, if you look at Wikipedia pages on this. And lying in the DNS, you know, is something that DNSSEC prevents. So when you run DNSSEC and you get this sort of structural uh, analysis, structural manipulation of the DNS, the two don't go hand in hand. DNSSEC actually makes your life weirder and bizarre things happen and all kinds of security alarms go flying off when the expected answer doesn't validate. So no, we, we stuffed it up and now we're refusing to do the other bit because the other bit's the hard bit. Um, so <laughs> what can I say about DNSSEC? Nice idea, a nice half an idea, really nice half an idea. It's the other half that's the, the difficult bit. Do you think RPKI is the same? Nice half. Oh God, I... yes. Oh God, yes. I um, almost, feel, I, I'm almost scared of RPKI after reading your uh, research about the measuring route origin validation. I want to talk a little bit about that. But before we go off this topic, there is a great question. What's your favorite web browser? My favorite web browser. God, these days, these days I use Chrome um, because I just love telling Google everything. Um, <laughs> as someone told me, and I think they're right, if you actually tell Google everything, at least your search is astonishingly accurate. Yes. And the amount of information leakage is the same because I can't hide from them. I might as well just go all the way and run to them and go, well, it's the lot. You know, there's no point in me hiding. You're just too good. So I, I use Chrome for that reason. It's actually not a bad engine. But, you know... Um, the security issues are frightening. Uh, one general question that I have is, you know, in recent years, I have read a lot of, you know, articles or just was part of discussions where I know dependency, especially from the recursive sites towards the root servers is kind of, you know, low, getting lowered and lowered over time. Uh, these, you know, recursive services, the big ones, kind of keep the, the root zone longer than the, its uh, TTL. You have done similar, you have done some research to prove that, I believe, is that correct? Is my memory right? Or am I, am I confusing you with somebody else? I mean, do you observe this? This is, a, this is a concern that keeps coming up. Like TTL might be something, but the actual, uh, you know, like almost like a recursive server never queries the root zone anymore. Do you observe similar things in your research? Or uh, have you heard anything about it? This is a just question. A friend of mine is texting me, <laughs> insisting the testing. Then, well, yeah. well, don't forget that a TTL is a suggestion, not a rule. It's a guideline, and, and so you've got an answer. You can hold it as long as you want. You can reuse it as long as you want. The TTL is a gentle suggestion to say, over at the source, I might change this by this time. You better check back with me if you want to be accurate. But if I don't care, then I don't care. Um, resolvers shouldn't ask the root. The root server should go away. There are only a small number of root servers and a huge number of massive resolvers. If all of them loaded the root zone, and it's only a couple of K big, we could get rid of this entire root service infrastructure. And the root zone itself would be a web object we just put it in the cloud and it's all over. So in some ways, the root server system, like many of the things we're dealing with today, 
is a 1990s answer. And the scaling in the last 20 years has meant that that 1990s answer is largely silly. It's the wrong way of doing it. We should not have these dedicated servers that spend their entire time saying no. <laughs> because to arm recursives with enough information to say no is only as hard as inset caching or a root zone transfer. It's trivial. And so Google, its public domain name service, does not ask root servers because they're doing the right thing. Every other recursive should do the same because that's the way you scale. You push everything back towards the user. How do you scale content data networks? Nah, you push everything back to the user. You just mindlessly replicate. How well are we doing with the root server system? Badly. How would we do it better? Get rid of it. And so if we said to the DNS today, I'm sorry, at the end of this week, the root servers are shutting down. Go figure. That was going to be my question. <laughs> well, you know, if, you were to, if you were to just say like all of the root servers right now, all around the world, just suddenly decide to shut down. Do you yeah, actually, on Friday. <laughs> do you think on Friday. That, do you think that there would be actually any real impact to it? We'd have a better internet. It would be faster. Wow. Because the recursives would be forced to actually load the root zone and serve locally. That and if you put the root zone yeah. in, you know, 50 different CDNs, we know how to distribute data. I mean, we, we do it every microsecond. This is trivial. And loading up the root zone into recursive, you're lazy if you're not doing it today. You're just lazy and stupid. And so the answer is, yeah, we could turn it off on Friday if we wanted. So why do we persist with this 1990 it's stuff? Politics. I don't know. I it's, pol it's politics, you know. Uh, well, I think I, it's just tradition. You know, it's the same reason why horses are still around. Just tradition. <laughs> it's it's cute and it's quaint. I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to share this video with a topic of DNS root servers, like horse cops. <laughs> around yeah, right. Here. Yeah, yeah, right. But but it, it's true. Like I said, we could cope with no roots on by Friday by simply saying to every recursive, get your act into gear. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff, as always, thank you so much. Guys, you have to visit Jeff's website. He has incredible, uh, I misspelled, I should apologize. I hate doing this, misspelled his last name. But I must say, Jeff's blog is one of the best things you can do when you are just sitting down and relax and you just want to get perspective of someone that who's really detail oriented i strongly advise you guys to please uh, visit it any final remarks thanks again we had a lot of people come in and more than 100 at some point right now i want to make sure uh, there's no more questions from our crowd thanks everybody but jeff any final words um i, I still say technology is a conversation and if you think the internet's a solved problem you are so wrong it's not funny we continuously evolve, we continuously change. And what was a good answer five years ago is probably the wrong answer today. And I think that's what makes all of this exciting. Most of what you know is probably just a bunch of myths. And questioning that, talking it through with others, understanding what makes all this better, faster, and most importantly, scale better, is actually the topic we all should be engaging with. So, you know, my final comment is, don't believe what you read, don't believe that we had that thought once and it's the right thought. Debate it, argue with it, grapple with it, because the result is it was just someone's good idea at the time. And whatever is a good idea tomorrow will still be a really good idea. So be brave enough to have it, be brave enough to share it, and we'll all be better off. Thank you. Thank you again. There are a few of the last comments that I want to pass to you. Great chat. Thanks for hosting these. And more comments like this. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. We will be with you with more scientists, more engineers, more executives trying to... I have really missed traveling, I must say. You know, I missed, <laughs> it. I, I missed meeting with Jeff and you know, joining his conversation with some other group of people in a nanog and just listening through and just learning through. And this is kind of my reflection to the community, trying to give community a, a, an opportunity. It's just like what we would do at Nano, beer and gear, right. you know, just come together, ask the question. And, you know, again, 
I know it's really early your time there. I would like to, you know, thank you once again, and I will be playing our video. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks indeed, and thanks to everyone for coming. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you.